Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Uh, you've picked a good day to be here, uh, despite what the bu- building may feel like. This isn't uh, a sauna. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the reason it feels like this is because we've got a, a baptistry full of water. We've got a baptism today. Um, I don't like cold water, so um, the water is nice and warm. Um, but it's not about me. It's a, it's a, it's a baptism for Charlotte and Banke uh, today, and. I'll explain more about what all of that means uh, later on, and we will be hearing from them too as to what God has done in their life. And it's also a good day to be here because we have uh, a lunch to follow the service. Uh, Everyone's very welcome to stay uh, for lunch together, uh, and and there won't be anything else after lunch today. Um, So please all stay for lunch. And then for this week, uh, just a reminder of the things going on, we have the Puzzle Club on Monday at 10 We have our prayer meeting here at 7.30 on Wednesday. The youth group's meeting on Friday at 6.30. And uh, next Sunday, we have uh, Andrew King leading our service. He's uh, the, uh, I guess, the the sort of leader of our association of churches. And after the service, um, I'll be sharing a little bit about um, the plans for uh, Cambridge House. And we will also be having a, a members meeting, and there's an agenda for that on the board at the back. But let's begin with the first song that uh, helps us to focus on what is truly central in Christianity. Christianity centers around Jesus Christ and him crucified, the cross of Christ. Astonishingly, it is in his death that our life is found. So we're going to sing this song together. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary. This, the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Let's stand. the power of the cross. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that these events that we have just sung about, this uh, Roman execution nearly 2,000 years ago, just outside Jerusalem, we thank you that what we have just remembered and recounted is not an event simply of the past, it is a present reality. We thank you that what Jesus did then has uh, tremors, repercussions that we feel today. We thank you that his sacrifice of his life then is the means by which we can be forgiven now, today. We thank you that the victory that he accomplished on the cross then, that he could say it is finished with his dying breath, is the reason that we can know you today, that we could be made right with you. It is the reason that we can share in that victory where death has been crushed to death. We thank you that Jesus is this mighty saviour who has done what we could never do. We thank you that he has taken in himself the evil of our own hearts, a lifetime of sin, and it has been uh, born by himself so that we could go free. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to see clearly the glory of the cross, to see what Jesus has accomplished there. And we ask, Lord, that we would see that as we uh, witness these baptisms this morning. We thank you for the way you have given us this, this physical representation of what Jesus accomplished, that we can share in that, that, that we can learn from that, even visually today. And we do pray for, for Charlotte and Banke. We do pray, Lord, that you would uh, encourage them as they obey the Lord Jesus' command to be baptised, as he commanded people to believe, to be disciples, to be baptised, we pray that you would bless them as they obey that command. And we pray that this would be a great reassurance for them as they have the sort of witness of the church, the testimony of the church, to encourage them in their faith. That this might be something that speaks to each of us in our need this morning. Lord, we pray, Father, for people here who have not yet trusted you. We do pray, Father, that they would see their need to turn to the Lord Jesus for themselves, that this isn't something where they can sort of ride, as it were, on someone else or ride simply on church attendance. Pray, Father, for that personal trust. And we pray, Father, for... (coughs) for where we have committed ourselves to you. We pray, Lord, that this would encourage us to keep going, to persevere, to uh, keep looking to Jesus as our saviour, to not see this as some decision from the past, but a present reality that we should walk with you and live for you. So, Heavenly Father, we pray, minister to all of us here this morning. Speak powerfully through the testimony of your people. Speak through your word afresh this morning. And may our eyes be lifted to the Lord Jesus. Yes, a crucified saviour, but a risen saviour who is seated at your right hand today and whom every one of us will one day see when he returns again. May we be ready for that day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) 
Well, what is this baptism thing that uh, we're doing today? Well, just, uh, to, just to explain the mechanics, maybe it's something you've never, you've never seen before. Uh, under, under the floor there, there is a pool of water. Don't worry, the covers over the top are perfectly strong. Um, you won't fall into that from your chairs. Uh, and, and it's filled with ordinary water, okay? It's um, part of what gets paid for in the water meter with southern water, I guess. Um, there's nothing sort of magical about uh, the water. And what we're going to do later on is the person being baptised, you get into the water and you basically fall back into the water and if all goes to plan, um, I lift them back up out again. <coughs> Why? You know, why do we do this? Well, there's nothing, again, sort of magical about the act of baptism. That doesn't in and of itself save or in one sense change anything. <clears throat> but it is a very powerful symbol, a picture of something that has happened spiritually. It's a physical picture of a spiritual reality, something unseen, if you like. And it's that spiritual reality that someone has become a Christian. Their sins have been forgiven and that they belong to Christ. So let me try and explain this um, with another symbol. Um, tick. And uh, let's, let, let's do some, some maths, okay? I'm sure you were all thinking you were going to do that when you came to church this morning. Um, here we go. We've got a few, few sums here. Anyone, anyone tell me the answer to this? Three plus four, what do you think? Seven. Seven, very good. Okay, seven, got a tick. Okay. Uh, what about this one? Ten plus two, what do you think? Twelve, yeah, you're very on the ball. And then what about this one? Let's have a think. Well, I, I worked this out and I got five. And um, it's got a tick. So it must be right, mustn't it? I mean, that's wrong. What do you, what, what's, what's the right answer then? Six. Six, right. Okay, so actually that's a, a, wrong, a wrong answer. So the fact that I gave it a tick then doesn't make the sum correct. The, the tick, if you like, is just a sign when, that something is correct. Uh, but it does, but it's, if you like, when you get a tick, someone's marking your work, aren't they? It's someone else and they're checking whether you've got things correct. And that's a little bit like what's going on in baptism. Baptism is a bit like a sort of a tick from the church. It's saying that as a church, we think that this person is a Christian, that they have repented of their sin, they have trusted Christ, they have had their sins forgiven because of their trust in Jesus' death on the cross. And that... I think, is a, is a wonderful assurance. It's okay, don't worry. And it's a wonderful assurance to have that uh, sort of testimony of the church because, it, because it's, it's not just me that's saying I'm a Christian, if you like. It's the rest of the church are affirming me in that as well. If you like, it's not me marking my own homework. It's other people saying, yes, we believe you are, you belong to Christ too. And so this, um, this, this sort of tick sign is, is really saying that you are just, to use the uh, sort of theological term, you are justified. You are in the right before God. God has accepted you. Your sins have been forgiven. You are never again under condemnation. But how can that happen? How is it that God can accept us? And this is where the, this symbol actually has some sort of significance in, in the shape of it. Because think of how a tick shape works, okay? You, you, you're going down, and then you're coming up, and you're coming up sort of higher than where you've gone down from. And that is symbolic of going down into death, going underwater in baptism. If you simply stayed underwater in baptism, you would die, wouldn't you? No, don't worry, that's not going to happen. Um, and then you come up out of the water, you are raised to new life. That, that is what 
this is symbolizing, and, and we get this in, in Romans 6. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It is saying that what has happened to Jesus, his death and resurrection, become yours. So in baptism, in one sense, you're putting your life in the hands of another. Now, that's a bit overdramatic, but you sort of get the idea. You're going down into water. In one sense, you're, you're sort of helpless. And it's that sign that we can't save ourselves. You're putting yourself in the hands of another, in the hands of Christ. And as you go into that water, it's a symbol of dying to your old self that life ruled by sin, and that sin that has been crucified with Christ on the cross. You share in his death in that way. He dies for your sin. And then you come up out of the water. You're raised to new life. It is to new resurrection life, Jesus' resurrection life. And that begins now. God is, is living within you as a Christian. Jesus' life is your life. And you're being raised to a better life, to everlasting life, and to a life that one day will include a new physical body, a new resurrection body like Jesus is. So that's what's going on in this sort of symbolism of baptism. It's showing that sharing in, in Jesus' death and resurrection. And just to go back to the maths... Um, you could think of our life as being like a long list of wrong sums. Okay? And, it, and it's, it doesn't really matter that much if you get some sums wrong. It does matter when we don't follow God, when we disobey him. And our life is a long list, not of ticks, but of crosses, isn't it? Where we've gone wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and the same mistake again and again and again. Well, what we're saying that Jesus has done is that he, if you like, has taken that exam for us. He's had a life where it's all ticks, where he's been tempted just like we are, and yet all the time he has done what is right. And so when you become a Christian, it's as if he has, take, he, he has given his life to you. It's as if he has done the exam for you, if you like. So all your crosses are taken away, and it's all his ticks. That's how God sees you. And you sort of think, well, that's just too good to be true. You mean everything that, that I've done that is wrong, Christ takes. Everything good that Christ has done belongs to me. That sounds too good to be true. It does, doesn't it? But it is true. That, that is the incredible glory of the Christian message, that Jesus takes our sin and we have his righteousness. And we know it's true because he rose from the dead and because he is alive today. So that's a, a little picture of what baptism means, and we're going to come back to that, uh, that tick symbol a little bit um, later on, too, in uh, the message that we're going to have. But we're going to sing now um, a hymn that, if you didn't follow all of that, that, it, uh, that explains the symbolism again of baptism. When Jesus died upon the cross, when he was buried in the grave, he bore the judgment I deserved, that he by death my life might save. So we're going to sing uh, this hymn together now and uh, let's stand to sing.
sit down. <clears throat> We're going to come now to uh, a reading from uh, the Bible, from Psalm 107. We're going to read uh, the, the sort of first portion of the psalm. We'll read the last bit a little bit later on. And what I want you to notice as we read this psalm is that there's a sort of a bit of a tick shape here too. People are being brought down into the depths and then rescued to a new life. And it's a pattern that we see actually throughout uh, the Bible. So, um, and after that, um, we're going to hear uh, from Charlotte and from Banquet. So, first of all, um, Psalm 107. Whoops. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them... Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the hungry and fills the, he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Well, we've heard some testimony in that psalm, and we're going to hear uh, some testimony now from Charlotte and from Banquet. From a young age, I attended Sunday school, hearing of the God who created the world and sent his son Jesus, who lived, died, and was resurrected. Admittedly, I was fascinated by this big, powerful, and yet mysterious God. Whilst I recall never doubting his existence, I did question his character. Does he really love us? Does he really hear our prayers? Being shy, it was easy to often feel overlooked by others, and I considered God to be no different. Fast forward to my teenage years, and my perception of an impersonal and distant God was about to be challenged. 
What started as a good intention to improve my diet quickly escalated into an eating disorder. Greatly troubled by the severe weight loss, my parents lovingly shared their concerns. Whilst others had tried to do the same before, I would dismiss them. Yet on this occasion, it was as if my eyes were opened to the reality of my declining health. Their concern scared me. I had become trapped and felt powerless to overcome this struggle. In fear and desperation, I found myself crying out to God and asked him to make me well. The road to recovery was long and challenging. Yet, with the patience and support of my parents, I could see my prayer was being answered. In time, I did regain my physical health, but internally, I had very little peace. The Lord clearly was not finished. Fast forward again to my first year at uni, and a friend suggested we do a Bible study on the book of James. At this point, I considered I had a pretty good relationship with God. I went to church, I was part of the CU, I knew the gospel, but on reading James, I was struck by a particular verse. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4. 4. Sadly, whilst I claimed to be a Christian, the fruit of my life told a completely different story. My sinful nature made me an enemy to God. And yet, even my good works wouldn't be enough to remove the shame this would bring. A later study in Romans left me just as speechless. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Mulling it over the nuggets of gospel truth I picked up over the years in light of these passages, the doubts that I had carried concerning the very nature of God began to shift. As more time passed, my path would cross with wonderful mature believers who would encourage me to study the scripture and they patiently discipled me in the process. Eventually, I could no longer deny that God truly does love us and desires us to be in relationship with him. Rather than leaving us to die in our sin, Christ came to live the perfect life that I could never live, and died in my place so that I may be reconciled to God, so that I may be his. Although I had attended church since my early childhood, it wasn't until my early 20s that I asked Jesus to be my saviour, no longer wanting to live this life on my terms, no longer wanting to be his enemy. What seemed like a simple prayer for healing from an eating disorder all those years ago transpired into a greater work that the Lord had planned to do in my heart. To this very day, this work continues, as I am a work in progress. But because of Jesus, I now have peace with God. I am forgiven of my sin. I can remain hopeful in trials, because he promises never to leave nor forsake us, and I have the hope and assurance of eternal life. The most incredible part is that I did nothing to earn or deserve any of it. It's all the work of an amazing God who not only loves us perfectly, but is love. Thank you. Elaine's going to now lead us in prayer uh, for Charlotte. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we want to thank you so much for loving us. We want to thank you that you are a good God. We want to thank you, especially for our sister Charlotte. And Lord, we can hear from her testimony the ways that you have led her, the ways that you have looked after her, the ways that you have heard her cry for help. And you have restored her to a right relationship with you. You have brought her that peace with God that passes all understanding. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you that he is the good shepherd who comes to seek and to save the lost. He comes to look for his sheep. And not only does he find them, but he guards them, he protects them, he feeds them. We want to pray for Charlotte that you would feed her daily from your word 
that you would protect her and guard her all of her days. And Lord God, that you would help her to walk in the light as you would help each one of her brothers and sisters here at Hope Church to walk in the light with her. And Lord God, we thank you for the fruit that we do see in her life already. And we pray that you would give her a heart to serve you in the local church, to love um, her brothers and sisters here, to love the lost, to hold out the word of life to all who will listen. Lord God, may you bless her this day and keep her. Um, for we ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in her life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Banke, as you've just heard. And, um, yeah, I want to share a little bit about my story. Um, so some of you might know me. Um, I moved here about almost a year and a half ago. Um, but I'll take you back a little bit to where it's come from. Um, so, um, yeah, I was fortunate to be born into a Christian home, to parents who, you know, knew the gospel, um, at least certainly understood many aspects of it. Um, and we went to church every single Sunday, uh, very devout. I'm Nigerian, so we didn't have the option not to. You had to go. <laughs> um, and so from a young age, I always knew about Jesus, always knew about you know, this girl that came to die for me, and um, I think similar to Charlotte as well, I don't really remember really doubting at a young age, I kind of was just like, oh yeah, this is, this is a thing, this is true, um, and yeah, you know, so I, I always knew, I was very familiar with Jesus, um, and I would say up until my teenage years, so, you know, kind of growing up in South London, I wasn't really allowed out, uh, if you know, you know because around the area that I grew up, Sheila might know, because we grew up in the same area. Um, so yeah, we were kind of always at home. That was how my mum kind of kept us in check. My parents are very strict. Um, but one day when I was around 17, my friend from school, from sixth form, she lived um, close by, and her church was close by as well. And she invited me, she was like, oh, we have this youth thing on a Friday, do you want to come? And I asked my mum, and she was just like, fine, you can go, because it was close by and it was a church. She was like, yeah. So. Um, I went, and um, that day, um, the preacher was preaching about hell. And again, growing up in the church, I kind of always knew about hell. Like, it wasn't, I was familiar, at least, with the concept of it. But I think it was the first time that I kind of was like, this is a thing, this is a real thing. Like, it became, yeah, kind of it hit home. And it was a thing of like, oh, like, it's a possibility. Like, I could go here, you know, the way in which anyone could go there. Um, and I kind of thought, oh my God, like I was scared. I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I don't want to end up in hell. Um, you know, and it was kind of like, okay, what must I do to not end up in, in hell? Um, and kind of looking back now, I think that was a little bit scaremongerish, but it certainly got my attention. And so I was just like, okay, like, you know, doing everything I can to not go to hell. It was like from then on, it was that. And so I remember then I like deleted my like catalog of like secular music. I was like, yep, yeah, it's got to go. You know, and, like a few other things that I thought maybe was a little bit in keeping or not in keeping with Operation Not Going to Hell. And so that's how it was. <laughs> that's how it was all through university. Um, and yeah, at university, kind of same thing. I found the church and I was going. Um, and um, yeah, I think I look back now and I realize that I didn't, I don't think I fully understood the gospel. It was very much a tick box exercise for me. We've been seeing the tick a lot, but it was very much like, yep, do this, you know, and you'll be fine sort of thing. Um, and then after university, um, I, yeah, kind of, yeah, things were, the real world got a little bit hard. There was so much uncertainty um, as to what I was gonna do. Um, and yeah, I started like just, I was reading the Bible in my room one day and I, the Lord opened up Ephesians 2 to me um, and that was the first time that I would say I fully understood. Um, you know, I was reading about where Paul was saying, we're saved by grace through faith and it's not our works. You know, and the Lord opened up my eyes and showed me that everything I've been doing has been very works-based. And so that, you know, if I got to heaven, I could be like, well, you have to let me in because I haven't done this and I haven't done that and I haven't done that, but everyone else has. So you've got to let me in as opposed to, Jesus dying for me for my sins, um, you know, and being raised for me and faith in him. And so it was the first time that I would say I understood the gospel and the Lord opened my eyes to it. And, um, 
you know, I was, and then I was reading Galatians 2 about um, where, was, where Paul was talking about, you know, you know, he's been crucified with Christ, he no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. And the life I now live, I live in love with the Son of God who gave himself for me. Um, I'll never forget that verse. And yeah, that was so transformative for me. And so, you know, and then I thought about what I was doing before. Um, I think at university, I was quite judgmental. Actually, years later, many years later, a friend told me, she was like, you were no fun at uni, you were kind of judgy. And that made me cringe so bad. Um, and I think it's because, yeah, it was very much workspace. I didn't understand the gospel. And, you know, and so I would say, like, my journey to faith has been that, has been God kind of slowly opening my eyes to the truth. So I didn't have, like, a dramatic conversion story. It was just over time, God being very patient with me, loving me, lovingly showing me his truths in, um, in his word, um, going to a really good Bible-believing church. And I think kind of today, you know, life can be really tough sometimes and um, really uncertain. And, um, you know, I love this quote by Tim Keller so much. And he said, you know, no one ever learned about their flaws by being told you have to be shown and sometimes part of the hardship is of life is being refined by God, being proved by God. You know, and he also goes on to say, no one ever learned that no one ever learned that God loves them by being told. Sure, you might intellectually understand it, but sometimes you have to be shown, and that is through active work and walking with God. And so, I say that's my life today. Um, yeah, it's yeah, many peaks and troughs. I would say um, quite difficult, but. Um, the one hope I have is Jesus and that he died for me and you know some days I think oh I don't know if I'm going to make it um, I remember Philippians 1 where you know Paul says he who started a good work in you will complete it um, and you know my favorite part in Jude where he says you know he's able to keep us from st you know, from stumbling and present us um, at the day of Christ with immense joy that's one of my favorite verses because whenever I'm kind of wobbly you know when I think yeah it's too hard or my faith is being severely tested I remember that and I remember that oh I'm being carried by God and my faith is in him and it's not in me or my works or anything and so um yeah that's how I got here today um so yeah very excited to be baptized and um yeah just very thankful that um God has really even times when he seems like he's not there at all um I know that he's always there because his word said he'd never leave us or forsake us so Thank you. Okay, Sheila's going to now lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Banky's life. We thank you so much for what we've heard about the work that you've done in our heart, Lord. We thank you that you brought her from a position where she thought her own righteous deeds and her self-righteousness would save her, Lord, to a true understanding that righteousness only comes from trust and faith in you, Lord, and from what you did for us, Lord, from your death on the cross for our sins, Lord. Whilst we were still, still sinners, you died for the ungodly, Lord. You looked at Banke and you set your love upon her, and we're so grateful for that, Lord. We're so grateful that you are a Lord that saves sinners. You're a Lord that saved Banke, even in her sin, even in her self-righteousness, Lord. And I pray that as she makes this public declaration of the wonderful work that you've done within her, that you would continue to remind her, Lord, that you're a loving God, you're a kind God, you're a gracious God, um, that you will continue to keep her, you will sustain her, Lord, and you will complete the work that you started within her because you started it and you can finish it. Um, and we pray also for her own walk, Lord, that she would remember um, where, else can, where else can she go, Lord? Do you have the words of eternal life? Um, and so I just pray for the decision that she's made to be baptized. I know it wasn't an easy one, but we thank you, Lord, for leading her to where she is now, Lord, for her obedience towards you in doing that, Lord. And as she becomes part of this body, Lord, that you would provide her with opportunities to serve, opportunities to, to love, um, the people in this church, Lord, continue to grow in her belief and her trust in you, Lord. And we just thank you that you're a sustainer, Lord, that you save and you keep us and you sustain us all the way till the end, Lord, and we are promised eternal life with you. Um, so thank you so much for um, Banke's life, for her decision to be baptized, and we pray that yeah, you would continue to keep her, Lord. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.
Well, we're going to sing a song that um, Charlotte has chosen, and she's not only chosen it, she's even recorded the music for us. Um, we, we sang this last week, so uh, hopefully we can give, uh, do justice to these great words. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. So let's, uh, let's stand and sing. going to read first the, uh, the end of that psalm um, that we, we read earlier, Psalm 107. We're going to read from verse 33. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who live there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. When their numbers decreased and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow, he who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased the families, their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, 
Let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Well, Psalm 107 is uh, telling a story, a real life story. It's a testimony. This is what happened to me. And I think the essence of the psalm is captured in actually how the the 2011 NIV uh, translates verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. That's a bit like what we've heard already today. Two different people, different backgrounds, different character, different experiences, different story of how they became a Christian. And if you asked around the church, you would find another 50 different stories. Or if you asked the millions of Christians around the world, and indeed across history, you would find millions of different stories. So never think, oh, I need a conversion story that's like their one. No, no, no. Everyone is unique and different. Each Christian experience is a bit like a snowflake, in that it's unique and different. God works in each person individually. This is not a sort of a cult. In cults, you mass-produce followers. Everything's all the same. It's like ice cubes. But God does it differently. There's a uniqueness. And yet in that uniqueness, there is a pattern. There is a similarity. And did you notice that in this psalm? There's a whole number of repeated verses and phrases. In verse 6, it says how they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And that's repeated on each of those four different uh, experiences. They're, they're, They're different sorts of trouble people are going through, but they call out to God in the midst of it. And again, the repeated thing in verse 6, he delivered them from their distress. In each occasion, they're different distresses, but God delivers them. And then in verse 8, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds. They are glad that God is doing this. They've been delivered to live a new life. So again, there's that sort of tick shape to their experience. They've been taken into the depths but they've been rescued and raised up to new life, never to be the same again. It's a pattern we see again and again through Scripture. You see it in individuals, someone like Joseph, who was um, thrown into a pit. He was sold as a slave. He ended up in a dungeon as a prisoner, and he was then made prime minister of Egypt. And you see the same thing in Israel as a nation. And I think what we are seeing here is something of Israel's story in this psalm. You have four different experiences being described. There's this sort of desert journey, this wandering where they're not quite sure where they're going. They're hungry, they're thirsty. There's a description of prisoners in this this deepest gloom, which uh, elsewhere is translated as the shadow of death. There's people with affliction in their bodies a sort of sick, so sick to the extent that they hate what is life-giving. And then there's those in danger on the sea, this, this overpowering storm. And I think what's going on here is it's not describing necessarily simply individuals' experience. These things are all plural. It's all let them. And it's an experience indeed to be shared with the whole assembly of God's people. It's not simply uh, some, as it's translated here, as in sort of different groups of people. It's more the sense of they. This is describing the experience of the nation. And it's obviously being described in a poetic way. Psalms are poetry. So what is going on? What is it describing? Well, the first description of that wandering in the desert, it sounds a bit like what happened to Israel as they came out of slavery in Egypt and they were in the desert on the way to the promised land. But in that experience, they were actually very well provided for in the desert. And they did know where they were heading, and it was more than a city. 
And I think the next three descriptions don't quite fit uh, easily with sort of other events going through Israel's history. So what is going on? Well, verse 3 is the clue. Those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. It's talking about their return from exile. It's actually a fulfillment of uh, the prayer at the end of the previous psalm. Psalm 106, verse 47, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from the nations. You see, what had happened to, to, the, to the nations of both Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms, after centuries of disobedience, they'd been taken into exile, into Assyria and Babylon, and indeed others ended up in Egypt. They were scattered. They were far from home. They'd been brought low. But it was not the end of God's working in them. They came to experience God's rescue, his grace. And I think these four different pictures here are ways of describing the experience of exile and the deliverance from it. And maybe you're thinking at that point, well, okay, that's all very nice, but so what? Um, I'm not Israel. Um, I'm not in exile. Nice for them. What's it got to do with me? Well, don't go, don't think that too fast, because this is actually something that applies to us all. It's humanity's story. Because Israel is really a microcosm of all humanity. It's like humanity in miniature on a smaller scale. Israel is like a sort of test case, a worked example of how God actually deals with everyone. And the beauty of of poetry and some of the ambiguity of that is that uh, it is describing things that we can all relate to. That sense of being lost in a big world, in that wilderness, in a wide open space. It's possible to be lost in that sort of place, isn't it? That sense of trying to find a city, what does that mean? Well, it's a place to call home, a place where you can be safe, a place where you can belong. So to not have that is like to be a refugee, to be unsettled, and to be in an environment that is arid, unforgiving that saps away at life. You know, how much does that maybe describe your life today? Or you can have the sense of being trapped in a small space, of being a prisoner, being hemmed in, oppressed. This gloom, the darkness, this gloomy darkness, the shadow of death. One way we're trapped is actually with our bodies, isn't it? We're ultimately on a one-way journey to death. That entraps us. And then we have this third picture of, um, of, of a sort of decaying body, but through self-destruction, through rejecting what is good. They loathed all food. They drew near the gates of death. Almost a picture of a sort of addict destroying themselves with their addiction. And then you have this picture of a storm where you're overwhelmed with forces that are more powerful than yourself. If you've ever been in, in the midst of a, of a fierce storm, you, you suddenly feel very small, don't you? When you, if you've ever been on the beach and just even the waves have been a bit bigger than normal, they, they sort of crush you, don't they? Well, imagine, you know, it's sort of tsunami wave. Imagine a, a really big storm. That sense of being overpowered... Well, that was how the Israelites felt in the face of Babylon, this massive superpower, this empire. And in the same way, we feel so small against the cultural forces that shape us today. The the, the government forces, the the, maybe the the sort of um, the power of poverty and the way it uh, can so destroy, the power of social media, all these ways that we can feel so small and powerless. And these are all ways of describing exile. And that is a situation all of us are in. Humanity as a whole is in exile. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we are away from home and we are under a destructive evil power. In what way? 
Well, we've been made by God. We've been made for God. And our home, our place of rest, our place of safety, our place of belonging, our place of acceptance is actually with God. The problem is we've left home. And actually that was of our own decision. We've decided we don't want God close to us. We're suspicious of God. We want to do our own thing. And actually that leaves us not as free people, but actually under the oppression of a foreign power, the oppression of sin and Satan. We end up as slaves trapped by our own desires. We are prisoners in that attempt to be free of God's home. So the trouble that is described in these four experiences is not just sort of fate or something. It's not, it's not just the way the world is. Well, that's just, just how things happen. Ultimately, what we have read here in these accounts are all due to sin. They are consequences of that exile, of that rejection of God, of not being at home in God's world. And I don't know if you noticed that, that there was difference how those four accounts were described. The in the middle two, they're directly tied to the people's sin. Uh, in verse 11, they had rebelled against the words of the Lord. They despised the counsel of the Most High. Verse 17, they became fools through their rebellious ways. And sometimes we can see how the trouble we're in is our own fault. Maybe through our own unfaithfulness or greed or anger or whatever it might be. But at other times, we actually suffer due to other people's sin. We suffer due to the reality of living in a fallen world that has disaster and disease and death that is a result of humanity's sin sort of collectively. And so in the first and fourth account, there's no specific sin that is mentioned. And yet, ultimately, what they are suffering is still due to sin somewhere. It's just not maybe the sin of the person suffering. But just as um, sometimes we are affected by other people's sin, so our sin, sometimes we get off fine, but it actually affects other people. We're all interlinked in this problem. It is a humanity problem. So whether it's directly or indirectly... The trouble that you are in today is the trouble of being in exile, the trouble of being uh, under the judgment of sin, of not being right with God. So this trouble that we all experience is actually a wake-up call. It's telling us there's a problem. And that is why this psalm constantly talks about the wonderful works of God. And you sort of think, well, that's a bit strange. This is talking about things that were actually really hard, really painful, really difficult. And yet, the psalmist talks about the wonderful works of God. These are actually evidence of his love. And that's because the most dangerous disease is a disease with no symptoms. If you don't realise you've got something wrong. That's the most terrible situation to be in. But God doesn't leave us like that. He has put us in this world of trouble and of suffering to show us there is a problem. We are in exile. We need help. So these are not just random events. This isn't just what fate has has given to you. It's not just the way life is. There is a reason, there is a story in what God is doing. And it's a story of rescue. Because not only is this humanity's story, it is God's story. In the last part of the psalm, it's it's very explicit that God is behind all these events. It talks about bringing fruitfulness. It also talks about uh, bringing judgment. And it's saying God is behind both. Uh, Isaiah 45, verse 7, I bring prosperity and disaster. God is behind both life and death. And it's telling us that God is doing those things now. This isn't just something in the past. There's actually a present tense here. So God is not distant. He is at work in events, in nations, 
and in the details of your life today. Or to put it another way, the Bible isn't about you. I don't know, do you sort of try and you read this psalm and you try and sort of put yourself in there immediately? Well, in one sense, it's actually about what, what God is doing in the first place. God is doing all of things, these things because he is at work. And you might be surprised by what God is doing here and the extent to which he is part of this story. Because God is not just directing this story, he becomes part of it. He actually comes as an Israelite, as a Jewish man, Jesus. He comes as a human being, a descendant of Adam. You see, he enters this story, Jesus Christ identified with us. We were thinking last week how Jesus was baptized. That was identifying uh, with us. That's, that's uh, another sermon. But what I want you to notice this morning is that he went through the same suffering that we know. He knew what it was to be hungry and thirsty. He knew what it was to, be, to have the experience of being a prisoner. Knew the experience of bodily weakness. Knew the danger of storms. So he had all that same experience as us. And yet what is so striking is when people met him, they cried out to him in their distress. Much as people in this psalm here cry out to God. People came to him and asked him for water. They asked him for healing. They asked him for rescue. And Jesus, even when they don't ask, he offers food to the hungry. He, he proclaims release for the prisoners. And he doesn't simply um, heal the sick, he even raises the dead. We read how he, how he commands the storm to be still. So he he's sort of experiences all of these things, and yet he is empowered over them as well. And then most remarkably of all, Jesus has this same experience of exile at the end of his life on the cross. Yes, he's a prisoner. He's not chained. He's nailed. He's in darkness. He's in a wasteland. He has raging thirst. He is not near the gates of death. He has actual death. And that storm, the waves of God's wrath, crash upon him. He talks about being forsaken by his father. That's exile. He's far from home, if you like. He is experiencing the full weight, the full consequences of sin. What we sang in that first song today. And yet he is innocent of sin. This, if you're worried about innocent suffering, well, here is true innocent suffering in what Jesus is experiencing. He deserves none of this, and yet he is bearing a weight of suffering that is beyond any, what any of us will ever know, because he has entered this story, he has gone into exile for us. And he was crushed in that way, and yet not destroyed. He conquers. Even on the cross, he was triumphing. One of the other people being crucified with Jesus cries out to Jesus for help on the cross. Imagine that as your testimony. Cries out to Jesus, well, Jesus is also on the cross, and Jesus immediately proclaims that that man is safe and is saved. He's able to do that even as he's dying. This is quite a saviour. This is quite a deliverer. So Jesus, if you like, went through that, um, that, that tick symbol in the deepest way. He went through to the depths of the cross, but he was raised to a new life, to everlasting resurrection life. And the point is that his story can become your story. And that's where we finish this morning. Are you wise? What it says in verse 43, whoever is wise, let him heed these things. Do you see God's love here? In the midst of what you are experiencing in your life, do you, how, how do you cry out? We all cry out in our distress, but, but what are you crying out? 
Do you cry out to yourself? Do you give yourself a little motivational talk? Yeah, I need to be strong through this. I need to try harder. I need to sort this out myself. Or do you cry out to God in cursing? That suffering becomes a reason not to believe in God. Well, neither of those routes will get you very far. You can cry out in a third way, in trust. You see, all of us experience these troubles. Not everyone cries out to God in trust. We need that wisdom. To cry out to God in that way in your distress requires a humbling. It requires a recognition that I am wrong. And I tell you, the first step to true wisdom is recognizing how wrong you can be. That's the first step, and that's a, a, a very humbling thing. It's the first step of repentance. You see, these people that once rebelled against the word of the Lord, who once cried out against God, are now realizing that their very rejection of God was the problem. It's a complete turnaround. And when you turn to God in that way, when you see you've got it wrong, when you see that you can't sort this out yourself, when you see that you can't sort of work your way to God, you can't reform yourself, you can't just have another new start, that's not going to cut it. Your problem is deeper than that. You need a saviour. When you turn to God in that way, when you recognise your helplessness, God always hears And Jesus' story becomes your story. You see, his death, his exile pays for your sin. His life, his victory then belongs to you. And that is what baptism represents. It's a wonderful thing. It's the intersection of your story and Jesus' story. His death and resurrection become yours. He's gone before you on this journey. He is like the sort of pioneer in your life who has gone before you. And he will go with you every step of the way. And the end of this psalm reminds us that this journey won't be easy. Following him won't be always straightforward. There will still be difficulties and suffering. Sometimes actually more difficulties and suffering because we're following him. But the wonderful truth is that he is with us. He is sharing his life with us every step of the way. And you are on that sort of upward side of that tick. You're on that line that will never end. That everlasting life that is found with Jesus. So what is your story this morning? What is is your testimony? Who are you looking to for life, for forgiveness, for salvation? See how Jesus has become this story for us and he will share that with you let's pray our heavenly father we thank you for the testimony of your word we thank you that we discover that you're the same god today that you were those thousands of years ago for the israelites the same god of love of compassion of grace a God who delivers those who do not deserve that deliverance. Thank you, Lord, what we we heard earlier from Charlotte and Banke of your great grace, the way that you intervened in their life, the way that this was uh, a work of your love. And we pray, Father, that you would help us all to see clearly your love being displayed in these things. Yes, even in hard things but to see that this is drawing it, to draw us to you, the the only one who can help us. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, give us that faith to cry to you today and to trust in you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing another song. This is one that... uh, chosen by Banke, and when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. See, we're on this journey. How are we going to manage? How are we going to cope? Christ is holding you. 
that's how you will cope. And uh, you know, when it says he will hold me fast, that's, that's really a way of saying he'll hold me tight. He will keep me safe. He will have his grip on you. So we're going to sing this, this hymn. But as we, as we do that, uh, we're going to be moving the sort of chairs at this end of the hall uh, and sort of clearing the floor there to then remove the, the baptistry covers. And at the end of the hymn, we can then sort of gather around uh, this end of the hall. If you prefer to sort of sit where you are, we should be able to have uh, another camera that will sort of show you what's going on on the screens uh, as well. So, um, you know, it's fine to sort of stay where you are if, you, uh, if, if, if that's what would be easier for you, um, unless you're in this bit, in which we do need you to move uh, for that. So let's, um, we've got a recording here, so let's uh, move to stand and sing this hymn. explain uh, what we are doing here again. Baptism shows us what Jesus has done so that we can be saved. 
Listen to what I read earlier there from the book of Romans. We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism is a symbol for what Jesus has done for Charlotte and Banke in bringing salvation. He has died and risen again so that they can be forgiven and have this new eternal life in him. And in baptism, they are committing themselves to a new life following Jesus Christ. Well, Charlotte, I've got a verse to encourage you at this time from Psalm 54 and verse 4. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. And I'm now going to ask Charlotte three questions, and after that, I'll baptise her. Charlotte, have you turned from your old life in which you were not submitting to God? Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life? Will you seek to follow Jesus Christ all your life by the help of the Holy Spirit? Well, on your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. this verse for you to encourage you. Exodus 15 verse 13. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. And I'm now going to ask Banke those same three questions and then baptise her. Banke, have you turned from your old life in which you were not submitting to God? Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life? Will you seek to follow Jesus Christ all your life by the help of the Holy Spirit? Well, on, on your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Charlotte and Banke have done today is uh, a challenge for all of us. They've trusted Christ. They've obeyed his command to follow me and be baptised. Well, what about you? Will you follow Jesus? Maybe this is something all a bit new to you. Maybe you've not really heard a testimony like that before. This, this whole message about Jesus is something perhaps a bit strange. You don't fully understand. Well, don't, don't just leave it. Don't think this is just for someone else. Find out who Jesus is and why he is the best person to follow. Or maybe this is actually all very familiar to you, but you haven't yet made that commitment. Well, don't hold back. As it puts it in scripture, today is the day of salvation. And it is uh, his command for us to trust him and to be baptized. Or maybe you're someone that's, that's done this years ago. Well, keep going and keep looking to the same saviour. You don't move on from, uh, in a one sense, from that day of conversion. You, we constantly need to look to Christ and knowing that he has gone ahead of us. He is with us all the way. If it feels hard to keep going, realise Jesus is still with you just as he was that day when you trusted him first. 
And I guess with that thought in mind, we're going to sing a final hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And let's just sort of stay where you are to sing and try and uh, see if you can see the screen. Um, and the song will come up uh, on here. So let's, let's sing this, this hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. in prayer. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Lord, we ask that this would be the testimony, the story, the experience of each one of us here today. May we see that Jesus is the saviour that we need today and every day. Help us by your spirit to trust him and to follow him, for we ask it in his name. Amen. <laughs>